as the Lord spoke to Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. And now is Reverend Sue. Good evening, and thank you again for joining us uh, Sunday evening with Reverend Sue. And, you know, this month in June is uh, Black Music Month, and we decided to have a good conversation uh, this evening. Back in 1979, President Jimmy Carter actually, um, uh, became, uh, it was back in 1979 when, when Black Music Month was really originated and since then we have been celebrating Black Music Month. So we are we are happy here today to have two outstanding gentlemen. Uh, one is from Arkansas, the other one is from Washington, DC. So Mr. Wesley uh, Peters is the co-founder of Conducting Creativity, a 501c3 uh, center around literacy invocation and uh, entrepreneurship in central Arkansas. So the, the organization has held literacy camps, uh, author uh, development programs and work alongside uh, financial literacy uh, with a pro program to, um, to build up young uh, professional and uh, entrepreneurs. So Wesley is a literacy agent and songwriter for a AMI, AMC, uh, records. So today, and it could be AM, AMG, I get that correct. I'm sorry. Uh, when we get, when we get started, AMG records. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And also we, 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 we find to have James, James Harris has been a, uh, a fun, um, and been to the, in the rap music for a long time for, since he was like one year old, I think. So now he's, he's getting old. So we have the older one, not really old, the Gen X, and we have the 20, the 20 something year old. And we are like totally two, very two different generations. And I'm between where I'm like, whoa, the baby boomer. So this is going to be really exciting, exciting to uh, this evening. So James is uh, also um, an educator. And like I said, a um, music producer and loves his, love what he does. And Mr. Wesley is definitely, definitely hot in the field. And he's just been a fantastic person. And we thank him for also joining us today. So the, the, the civil rights era had uh, movement music like Curtis Mayfield moving, moving on up and James Brown. Uh, I'm black and I'm proud and, and, and we ain't gonna let nobody, nobody turn us around. That was um, basically uh, covered by the roots. So in this, in this era right now, two, 2022, where we are facing uh, an America where there are white Americans uh, desperately trying to march backwards to the 1950s, what anthem uh, or movement or music or title would you advocate for African American now? And and uh, Miss uh, Mr. Peters, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so that's a good question, uh, Reverend Sue. Um, when you kind of mentioned the civil rights movement, uh, me being kind of having a political background, the first thing I immediately thought about was. Um, James Brown and people like James Brown used to open up for Dr. King. So um, when you speak of the movement, uh, music has always been a part of our movement. I was actually talking to a, um, a producer the other day. He's in his 80s and he was telling me how um, whenever this different civil rights icons, whether it be Jesse Jackson, or Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, whoever it was, whenever they used to come to a city, the first thing that they used to do was uh, reach out to the local disc jockeys. Um, sometimes even before they went to the church, they would go to the local uh, local promoters because they knew if they can get the message uh, on the airways, they can reach the people. So mm -hmm. um, today, um, to answer your question, 
it's a little bit different because um, industry has become such a uh, silo. And uh, but because we have independent music too, um, those same messages are being spread, but they're more so underground. So um, I'll let Mr. Harris kind of say his piece. I don't want to talk too much. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, uh, James, what about you? Um, I don't know um, as far as an anthem for today, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know what what's an a anthem um, that's addressing or, you know, the issues, the racial issues that we are, we're, we're undergoing in this country. Um, I mean, I just, man, I'm not aware of it. Um, I try to keep my ear to the streets, but what I can honestly say, I think, um, you know, being a Gen Xer, you know, in the early 90s, you had groups like Public Enemy, who had a powerful song called Fight the Power that came out in 1990. And, you know, that's that song was addressed in, you know, the racial climate as well during that time um, in the 90s. Um, as far as today, uh, I agree with Mr. Peters saying, I, it, I know it's, it's out there, I just think there's the music business itself has changed so much. There's so many platforms now. And I think it's a lot of it's underground. You know, you have a lot of underground music that's um, that may talk about these things. But I think the challenge is, is trying to get those songs or artists from underground to become mainstream. See, the, the advantage that Public Enemy had, hip hop was still sort of new. You know, it came out in the late 70s, it's now 1990. And it was it wasn't necessarily it was just beginning to become mainstream. So it, I think a lot of time it was timing, you know. So in today's era, you know, hip hop has been in existence since technically since 1973. So, you know, it's now mainstream is backed by corporate corporate dollars. And that's another thing. Um, I, 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 my early years as a, as a teenager, you know, when hip hop was raw and new, you know, it was it was underground and corporation didn't really grab a hold onto it until like the 90s. Now it's been backed by corporate dollars for so many, you know, now decades. Um, it does seem to me, on purpose, in my opinion, <laughs> that uh, I think a lot of the corporations they wanted to dumb down the, uh, the original intent of rap music and just music, black music in general. Because I'm not just speaking of hip hop; I'm even talking about even R and B, you know. So, it's, but back to the original question, as far as an anthem, I'm not. I, I don't know of a song or anything that's can be an anthem. Maybe I need to just really think about it, but you know, right now mm -hmm. I can't. Well, let's thank, thank you, James. Thank you. I understand what you're saying. So basically, I'm, I'm thinking about the the 2020 uh, fight the power remix that has addressed some of the issues that we we're, we're talking about. And another thing is that, so I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is that so? What role? So the the music industry. What role? does music currently have in the black community so it really doesn't have a role i mean it should it should have a role but it's not it's not following the, the what they should be doing the responsibility a role do they have a role in the, in the black community black music i mean it does the music industry does, does music have a currently role in the black community um well i, I think it definitely has a role in Kind of go back to your first question. If I had to give an anthem, uh, I know my little cousins love the little baby song. It's bigger than black and white. I think it came out in 2020. Um, so uh, if I had to choose an anthem, I guess I would go with that. But um, definitely music has a role, um, especially when you get into um, individuals. So I know uh, for me personally, I still listen to the radio, but I know a lot of people don't listen to the radio. So when people are able to curate their own playlist, that goes a long way into the, the personal influence that they choose to mm -hmm. have. Um, so I, that goes a long way. We were kind of speaking yesterday on the, the power of just the underground circuit. So any city that you go into is going to be an underground art scene. Um, that goes a long way into just the culture of that city, just the same way as uh, local politics goes a long way into like the economics of that city. So um, music definitely has something to say about the culture. Um, the mainstream uh, mm -hmm. artists definitely uh, have a large influence on um, my generation, the generation after me. I don't know if this is big as 
when uh, rap was just starting off and it was just, we all come right here in, in these four squares of rap and, and, and we do it like that, but um, it definitely still has influence. Mm -hmm. So it's still there. It's currently doing a role, yes. What about what about um, uh, the childish uh, Gambino? This is America as well. Uh, what are what are what what are your thoughts on that song? So that song actually came out when I was in college, and we mm -hmm. used to literally sit around uh, in my apartment building. So. Uh, Y'all on the East Coast, my favorite movement uh, in this history, American history for sure, is the Harlem Renaissance. So mm -hmm. we kind of had an experience like that in my apartment complex. Mm -hmm. We Anytime new music came out and somebody said it was hot, we were dissecting it. So uh, that Gambino, that uh, when that came out, we were like, dang, what this mean? <laughs> so we're looking at, like, oh, that's, that's what this mean? It's just, it was so many... Um, some dissect that music video. So that definitely was good for um, the sociology and the conversation of the church. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of music that uh, we get mainstream kind of like this is dumbed down. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't create room for us to have vivid conversations. Oh, that was hard. Oh, that sucked. Mm -hmm. So in, in that moment, that was a that was a good moment in art for me. Right. So, listen from a, from the um, venturing into another challenge. How should we as people respond? Uh, Fulton County, you know, Fulton County, Georgia, the district attorney, allegation that rap music use evidence to justify uh, to justify uh, gang members' arrests. And what are you, what are y'all thoughts, James and um, Wesley? What are y'all thoughts on that? Because that's that's really literally going on now. Well, and this is why I may sound like an old man. <laughs> My thoughts, because um, yeah, I've heard about that. I think that's uh, I believe the rapper's Young Thug, I believe. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and that's been going on around the country. You know, in New York, they have the New York drill scene where they've done the same thing up in New York. You know, arresting. Um, or underground rappers, and they're using their lyrics to, um, you know, to uh, to make arrests. Um, and from what I understand, a lot, particularly with the New York scene, a lot of those cases, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they actually committed these crimes, and they're rapping about it, you know, Instagram talking about it. Um, you know, uh, even the Chicago drill scene. You know, um, what mm -hmm. my, my problem is is that. If you're doing a crime and you're rapping about it, <laughs> to me, it's just common sense. I mean, they can use that again. And I just wish, you know, um, I wish young artists would think think twice about, first of all, just don't do the crime, number one. But, you know, if, if you're making these records and you're mm -hmm. documenting the base, talking about what you've done, you know, I mean, you can't expect the long arm of the law, you know. Is it racist? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quick to say it's necessarily racist because if I know if a loved one was affected by one of these rappers and a crime, I would want them, I want justice to be. So it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of tricky, but at the same time, you know, a lot of these artists, to me, in my opinion, they just have to think, you know, I'm, you know, it, you know, you know, why would you, document that and then you know and, it, and a lot of times you know you're bragging on the crime you did and everything if it whether or you know <laughs> shooting up somebody's block um you know and, and the thing with the black community we have to be real with ourselves the black community we have to start taking accountability of things that we do in our own communities you know so mm -hmm. if it is use people the um you know police force starting to use lyrics to songs to make arrests what have you I mean, you know, you know, I, I don't know. It's this that's something I can't say is necessarily racist at this moment. You know, but mm -hmm. well, remembering, remembering, um, of course, the Johnny Cash lyrics talked about killing multiple people. So we have to think about that as well. I, I think, I, from my standpoint, I think is a as a could be a, a social justice situation here. Could be racism because if you're treating the uh, 
artists, totally different than from the white artists. That's something that we, we as a people, a community should be paying attention to. Uh, Ms. West, how do you feel about that? Um, so I, I, I look at it, I think, first from just the sociological perspective and saying that I don't think you can put everything in a vacuum. Um, so I think that the racism is saying that the crime is because of the rappers and the lyrics, um, not because of you know economic deprivation. Have you? Um, I think a larger conversation to me, I think about this often, is simply literacy. So, um, what when, when you sit down, this is a producer can attest to this too. When you sit down and you write a song, you you write based off of number one, what you know, or if you're an industry artist, you're writing on what they tell you to write about. Uh, or somebody's giving you lyrics. Um, mm -hmm. But I think just in basic fundamental development, more of an of seeing Black greatness as opposed to popping perks. Um, and, and I think that goes just basic secondary education. What kind of books are we reading? Are we reading books that, that show us as, uh, as a slave all the time? Are we reading books? That just so the white man as the superhero. Um, and that's that's kind of for me, I go back to the 60s when uh, you have people like James Baldwin mm -hmm. uh, advocating for uh, black history. You had Dr. John Henry Clark advocate, advocating for black history, not just the slave civil rights portion of black history, but it's much deeper than that. So and mm -hmm. from my experience in dealing with artists, when you expose them to other things, outside of just what's common um, on the radio or outside of what they were taught in their public school system, their writing just expands. It's kind of like eating good food. When you have good food, when you taste good food, it's a new experience. I can't just say, oh, this is good. I got to get a new word. My vocabulary has to become more, uh, it has to become bad, more vast. It has to become more extensive because I have this new experience. So um, my answer your question, I do think that um, there's racism in mm -hmm. saying that, oh, these rappers, then, but I also agree with Mr. Harris. You can't just go, you know, do all of these things or lie about doing all these things and expect you not to have an influence on the next generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, we talk about various, um, you know, we talk about rap music. And uh, yes, Jane Bowen uh, described uh, mentality as being in a constant state of rage. James Bowen, yes. So what, what influence does gospel play in the lives of Black Americans on the pressure from racism? Either you can, you can, you can talk about that, um, Mr. Peters. Uh, so gospel has definitely, since the foundation of, you know, the black church gospel has always had influence, whether it be through hymns, spirituals, um, <laughs> the black church in general uh, from emancipation, pre-emancipation has had huge influence on black people, black politics. Um, they were a lot of times the first banks in our communities. They were the places where you can get uh, loans and help out with housing, uh, different things like that. Um, in the early 2000s, that began to shift. It was a couple laws that passed that put, uh, that stifled the black church to a certain extent. Um, gospel music today, I don't know if it's penetrating the way it needs to penetrate simply because it's a lot of hurt that stems from uh, the church that my generation, like we talk about healing a lot. I want to heal. I want to grow. I want to heal. I want to grow. And we mm -hmm. can uh, clearly see and articulate that the church has let us down in certain ways. Therefore, a lot of us, even if the message is good, aren't ready to receive it because of where it's coming from at this moment. So. I would 
challenge the black church and it's some that do a great job of it. I'm not talking to them specifically to mm-hmm. reach out beyond those four walls. Um, remember the, 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 the Black Panther Party and the Breakfast for Children Party and how, how outgoing those communal efforts were to bring people in. So I think we have different models that we can look at and the black church has been great over time. I think now is the time that the black church has to really look at themselves and not just as individuals, but people who represent Christ along with them and say, hey, yeah, he may have hurt you or she may have hurt you. That doesn't represent the whole body. And I think just getting back to the basics of what the Bible says the church is supposed to be as opposed to um, how we would want it to be today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then and the small churches, mega churches, there's still things that we, we should do. I'm, I'm thinking as you talk and thinking about James, you have a, a 501c3 a literacy program. You educating your you educating the children, teaching them entrepreneurship. James is a producer; he's an educator. I'm just seeing so many work that the work that we need to do to them because they're producing. The young people are producing the music every single day. How do we you get into them and educating them and say, "Oh, wait a moment here. You know, wait a moment. We don't have to go there because you're gifted anyway. You're a good writer. You're a good singer. Uh, your m- musician is great. So maybe we need to start really concentrate on that. And so we may we will bring y'all back where you bring you in the space where we need to be as a people, and not get sold out because they're still constantly making money of of you know of violence, constantly making a lot of money. Not necessarily the, the, the singers, but the the companies. So James, um, just for a second, how do you how do you address that issue? Well, um, I think it's very complex as far as you know. Is gospel music penetrating our culture? Is it still has a is it still relevant in our culture and today? Um, there's a lot of debate as far as the sound of gospel music. Should it sound up to date? Some um, pastors, religious uh, leaders think it may sound too worldly. You know. And unfortunately, you know, throughout the history of gospel, um, I mean, throughout the decades, gospel music always did, you know, reshape and define the sound. But with the with pastor saying that, okay, we don't want it to sound too worldly, and it's not a third, you, 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 it's a risk of, you know, not drawing in the youth. You know, the youth have a different ear of what sounds good to them, what draws them to them, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of complex in that, you know, because I'm not going to lie. I had issues with hearing that as well in the in the late 90s about, you know, you know, you make gospel music that has a up-tempo hip hop beat is worldly, you know. And I always felt like, well, if the message is about, you know, getting to know the Lord, accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know, what's wrong with that, you know? Um so it's, it's, it's complex. I think that's something the black church has to uh, deal with. Um, and maybe some churches just have to be bold with it. Like we want to, we want to save uh, the youth soul. We want, we want to spread the, the, the kingdom of God by, you know, um, by any means necessary, as long as it's led by the Holy Spirit through, God, through Christ. And if it is making music that sounds a beat, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You can have a mixture. You have the traditional sound. You can have your, you know, today's modern sound. Um, but I think that's playing a role on why gospel music may not be as, um, maybe hold as relevance like, like compared to maybe 30, 40 years ago. So what are we looking at? The, what are we looking at? The, 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 the music of the word. So we, are we focused on the music and the word of both. It's both. I mean, you make music, you add words, it's content, you know, so they, you know, it's just, it's just this debate, theological debate about how gospel music should sound. In my opinion, in my opinion, things are foolish debate, personally, because if that's the case, then what did praising the Lord music sound like in the days when Christ would walk the earth, you know? It's not going to sound exact same, you know? We have technology you know, instruments, you know, and, you know, it's, it's just being creative. And if it's, if you're doing it for the Lord, it's in your heart to do it for the Lord. I think it should not be a debate on how it, the, how the sound of it comes out, you know? Okay. And that's just my opinion. You know, Cause music is creative. That is universal. It's universal. It's creative. 
Okay, I think that uh, one thing, um, uh, Mr. Peters, just leave one thought with us for our, for our listeners, our audience, one thought that you, you think that would be very critical and important right now. Um, just reach back. Um, when Mr. Harris was talking, this is all the way off the wall, but when he was talking, <laughs> um, I was playing Rick James in the car the other day and my cousin mm -hmm. was in the car and Super Freak came on. And I know when that came out, they was probably getting down to that. My cousin was like, oh, this boring, he's making me go to sleep. So I'm just like, okay. Um, but I know in, in that time, you had met probably a bunch of older people like this. That's that's uh that's safe. Let's put that down. That's uh you know what he's talking about. Like he get nasty in that song. Whereas now when they hear that same song, they like that's a lullaby. So I think uh for me especially, I, I would encourage both the older and the younger generations to look at the lyrics of the music that we listen to because look, the Supremes, uh Gladys Knight. Curtis Mayfield, they were smooth and getting in there too. And they might not be as explicit as we might be today, but I think if, if we simply look into the messages of the music, we can see that not much has changed. Um, and although the beat and the tempo may have changed, not much has really changed. So I think if we can get past that conversation, we could progress more just as a people. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, James, how about you? Want to repeat the question again? Just one thing you would like to leave with our audience this evening. Um, I mean, just continue to celebrate our culture, you know, um, and continue to, you know, uh, move forward with our culture. Um, being at Black Music Month, um, I'm all about creativity. I'm all about you know, artists just creating from the heart, you know, um, get inspirations from anywhere. Um, I do think there's to be more artists that's willing to, um, as far as represent Christ and just, you know, think outside the box and how you want to get yourself out there, you know, and just have fun too, have fun in creating, you know. I think there's a difference in, I noticed with today's generation back when we was, you know, into music, you know, years ago when I first discovered my love of making music. Um, you know, it's, I wonder if there's a lot, is there fun? Are they having fun? And just in general, even as a listener and joy of music, you know, to broaden horizons of music. Because like you say, there's a big underground that Mr. Peters was talking about, a huge underground. And you have to platforms to search for that music with the, with the you know, uh, the, with the internet, you know, you can find a lot of things out there. So, you know, but just to continue to move forward, you know, with the music in our culture, you know. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, James Harris, thank you so much for your cre creativity and continue to produce music and, and, and make a change, make a change with your, as an educator, make a change as a Christian, make a change as just a man in your community, in your, in your country, in, in this world. And uh, Mr. Peters, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, you know, Arkansas, Central Arkansas, and and having having a five hundred one c three, where you focus on, on young people uh, entrepreneurship and educating them to what we really, really, really need, and, and taking that opportunity to let them know that perhaps you need to look at the lyrics. Maybe you look at the lyrics, and you still, like James said, to be creative and enjoy, enjoy. The creativity because creativity really comes from God. So you enjoy, it. don't don't get so bored down to become such a boring type situation and then you go into court for what you said. Don't don't get into that. So we thank you all for taking the time. I really appreciate it and may God bless you. And to our listeners, we know that we have to continue to pray because a lot going on in our in our in our society right now. A lot of things happening, but listen to God speak to you. And I believe that. What God is constantly speaking to us through music, through music, through songs and conversation. Let And when God speaks to us, let us understand and go out and do something about it. Just don't, okay, God, we, God wants us to move and work and, and, and do these things. So may God bless you and, and continue to be with you. You'll be listening to Sunday evening with Reverend Sue.